Well, good morning, Lakemont. Uh, it's actually afternoon here at the church office, but I'm presuming uh, you are watching this Sunday morning. So once again, this is not ideal, but this is what the Lord has for us. So it is now my privilege, uh, hoping and assuming you have had a good time of worship and of lifting up the praises of our God to now come together to his word. Uh, we are beginning a new sermon series in 2 Samuel, but we're also really continuing the story of 1 Samuel, as again, they were originally one book. Uh, and so in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 through 16, we are actually picking up where we left off at the end of 1 Samuel chapter 31. Uh, if you recall, David had been spared from having to fight against his own people with the Philistines. He returned to Ziklag and found that he had to fight the Amalekites uh, to recover his and his men's wives and possessions that they had captured in a raid. David does not know that at the same time, Saul and Jonathan, leading Israel's army, have been killed in battle with those Philistines. Saul by his own hand. David also does not know that Israel's army was defeated and scattered. And now in our text today, the story of Saul's death that we read in 1 Samuel 31 is now retold. But something is off. We're going to look at the problem of the messenger, the differing stories, and the response of David, all under the covering of the judgment of the Lord, as we look together at first Sam, excuse me, Second Samuel, chapter one, verses one through sixteen. I remind you as always, this is the word of the Lord. After the death of Saul, when David had returned from striking down the Amalekites, David remained two days in Ziklag. And on the third day, behold, a man came from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. And when he came to David, he fell to the ground and paid homage. David said to him, Where do you come from? And he said to him, I have escaped from the camp of Israel. And David said to him, How did it go? Tell me. And he answered, The people fled from the battle, and also many of the people have fallen and are dead. And Saul and his son Jonathan are also dead. Then David said to the young man who told him, How do you know that Saul and his son Jonathan are dead? And the young man who told him said, By chance I happened to be on Mount Gilboa, and there was Saul leaning on his spear, and behold, the chariots and the horsemen were close upon him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me and called to me. And I answered, Here I am. And he said to me, Who are you? I answered him, I am an Amalekite. And he said to me, Stand beside me, and kill me, for anguish has seized me, and yet my life still lingers. So I stood beside him and killed him, because I was sure that he could not live after he had fallen. And I took the crown that was on his head, and the armlet that was on his arm, and I have brought them here to my Lord. Then David took hold of his clothes and tore them, and so did all the men who were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan his son and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. And David said to the young man who told him, Where do you come from? And he answered, I am the son of a sojourner, an Amalekite. David said to him, how is it you were not afraid to put out your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Then David called one of the young men and said, Go, execute him. And he struck him down so that he died. 
And David said to him, Your blood be on your head, for your own mouth has testified against you, saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. The word of God. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come this morning seeking your blessing upon our time in your word. O Holy Spirit, grant us insight and illumination. We want to understand it rightly. Would you help us to see our own hearts more clearly, more honestly, and in a way that drives us anew to Jesus, your Son, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Just in case some of you think I only read theology books, history books, and Lord of the Rings, I want to let you know that frequently I also read what we might call escape reading or beach reading or airplane reading, uh, books like adventure books. Uh, one of the one I've read a lot of is the Dirk Pitt novels by the late Clive Cussler. Uh, if you're not familiar with them, Dirk Pitt is an underwater explorer and adventurer who always winds up battling evil megalomaniacs who somehow threaten the world. Well, one of the fun things about these kinds of novels is that the bad guys always get their just desserts. For instance, in one of his most famous novels, Sahara, uh, later made into uh, an enjoyable B-movie, although Clive Cussler hated it, uh, the bad guy in Sahara is a sleazy French industrialist and opportunist, opportunist named Yves Massard, whose manufacturing plant in the African country of Mali is leaking toxic chemicals down into the underground water table and is threatening a world environmental disaster, global contamination. People who drink this water in Mali die horribly and painfully. He, on the other hand, knowingly drinks only bottled water. At the end, after his schemes have been foiled, he seems to get away, but not before Dirk Pitt and his friend give him a water bottle, which he drinks. And it turns out this bottle of water is filled with the very contaminated water by his own chemical waste products. It's appealing. It's poetic justice. Just desserts. Now, in real life, justice often seems absent or fleeting, sometimes impossible. But, as our confessional reading teaches us, we believe God does punish sin in this life, and especially in the life to come. But since he punishes it in this life, we may presume that at times we will see God's judgment on people, rightly or wrongly, meaning our perspective can be right or wrong. When it's wrong we may, or right, we may also feed our own self-righteousness and rejoice in their downfall. All of these issues, all of these things, are things that our text addresses. So first we're going to notice, and hopefully you have your sermon outlines, uh, the danger of seductive opportunism. After the introduction in verse 1, uh, reminding us where everything is, we see a young man appear. And we are told he, is, he came from Saul's camp. And the author gives us the clue right away, this will not be good news. Because he shows the signs of mourning, of deep distress. His clothes are torn. And dirt is on his head. David asks his identity. Where do you come from? And he gets a very ambiguous answer that doesn't tell him a lot. I have escaped from the camp of Israel. We presume David is really more concerned now with news. 
He knew that the Philistines had been going into battle with the army of Israel. And he doesn't know the outcome. And so he asked, and he is told, in order, the Israelites have fled from the battle. Many have been killed. And King Saul and his son, David's friend Jonathan, are both dead. Verse 4. David wants to know how he knows this, and the young man tells him, and to summarize, he basically says, Saul was surrounded, he asked me to kill him, so I did. And I took his crown and the armlet, and I brought them to you. Now, if you remember 1 Samuel 31, we know there's a problem here. It doesn't jive with what we read there. Some critics will actually say this proves the Bible contradicts itself. Well, actually, the answer is a little simpler and more obvious. But if we remember Psalm 31, uh, excuse me, 1 Samuel 31, Saul asked his own armor bearer to kill him. The armor bearer wouldn't, and Saul killed himself, and then the armor bearer followed suit. The man is lying. He claims to have been there by chance. Most likely, he came right after the battle, after Saul's death, but before the Philistines had desecrated and stripped the bodies. He may have been there in time to overhear Saul's request, or simply seen Saul fall on his sword. And he saw an opportunity a chance to earn favor with David, knowing, like many did, that David would soon be king. And in verse 8, we are given the additional information that he is an Amalekite. David has just finished striking down and killing a group of Amalekite raiders. Saul's kingship was rejected by the Lord in 1 Samuel 15, for failing to destroy the Amalekites. So if we hadn't already known that this account was problematic, the narrator of Samuel is giving us that hint. Even if David doesn't know he's being lied to, the narrator wants us to know something is wrong here. David will later say in 2 Samuel 4.10 that the Amalekite thought he was bringing good news to David. The man probably wants a reward for bringing the royal symbols to David, or perhaps he's hoping for a physician in the new regime that his news would bring about. He shaded and stretched the truth of what he had done on the battlefield, scavenging among the dead to try and make himself look better and to increase his chance of financial reward or maybe gaining a position, status, and prestige. Now, when we put it like that, doesn't it seem relevant today? How tempting is it when we see a need we can profit from? Maybe we've hoarded toilet paper or disinfectant wipes or rubbing alcohol a situation we can take advantage of, a seeming opportunity to benefit us, maybe just by modifying the truth a little, manipulating the situation, or withholding key details. How easy it is to rationalize. How subtle the temptation to take advantage of others and think, that no one will know. But as we will see, the Lord sees all things, even into the depths of our hearts. We are always, as the Latin phrase says, coram Deo, before the face of God, who, as Psalm 90, verse 8 reminds us, has set our iniquities before him and our secret sins in the light of of his presence. Self-seeking and opportunism come 
too easily to us, especially in those times when we think no one will find out. But our hearts are laid bare and our inmost thoughts known by the one who created us and who will one day justly judge all sin. That bears remembering each and every day. But we will also see in David's initial reaction, secondly, the significance of God-centered grief. If a man who has been persecuting you, trying repeatedly to kill you, and who has the very position that you have been promised by God, if he is killed, what kind of response would you have? What kind of response would we expect David to have? Again, this was why the Amalekite expected this would be good news to David, but our passage shows otherwise. Verses 11 and 12. Then David took hold of his clothes and tore them, and so did all of the men who were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan his son, and for the people of the Lord, and for the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. The question we have to ask as we look at those verses is, why did David, why did his men respond this way? Isn't this what they wanted? Isn't this what they had hoped? They responded this way because the Lord had given them hearts, to use Jesus' words, that sought first the kingdom of God. We might expect them to mourn Jonathan, especially David, but not Saul. Yes, Saul. This was the Lord's king who was now dead, the Lord's army who was now defeated, and the Lord's people now defenseless, and many of them dead, as verse 12 teaches us. Also, as Richard Phillips suggests, David, quote, knew that God is displeased by a heart that is vengeful, even against one's enemies. David knew the spiritual principle before Solomon, his son, wrote it as a proverb, he who is glad at calamity will not go unpunished. Proverbs 17.5. Phillips continues, one reason why God's people are not to rejoice at judgment, even the judgment of so flagrant a rebel as King Saul, is that almost inevitably it involves us in offensive self-righteousness. He concludes, only God is competent to dispense judgment because only God is perfectly holy. And as we consider this event in light of the cross, we're reminded also we are called to love our enemies, to do good to those who persecute us, not to rejoice in their downfall. Jesus himself died while we were yet his enemies. So we can mourn our own enemies. Even if we give thanks to God for the relief their removal brings us, we don't have joy at what happens to them. David's heart reflected this kind of mercy and grace that he had received, and so he has genuine grief at what has happened. Dale Ralph Davis says, The grief of David and his men is impressive. The condition of the people of God disturbed them, and the same principle should control our life in the kingdom. Do we not have an obligation to mourn over the unbelief, apostasy, and coldness in the visible church? End quote. Do we not, should we not, mourn for what we see among mainline churches, among churches that have abandoned scripture, abandoned biblical beliefs and practices. 
And again, I might add, does seeking judgment or calamity upon an enemy bring you pleasure? Does it stoke, like feeding a fire, your self-righteousness? Or when you see things like that happen, do you use it rather as an occasion to consider God's rich mercy to you? in spite of the judgment that you so richly deserve as well. How quick we are to see others' sins and ignore our own. How easy it is to magnify their sin and wickedness and minimize our own. And how frequently do we justify our own sins while condemning greatly the sins of others. The mercy of God in Christ to us should make us tender-hearted, merciful, forgiving, and enable, even able us to love, and yes, even to grieve for our enemies. It should cause us to mourn unbelief and faithlessness in the visible church rather than to puff us up at our own orthodoxy or our superior doctrine, so we say. Judgment of which death is always a clear reminder should always humble us, grieve us, and cause us to seek to cast ourselves anew upon God's great mercy. So the grief that David and his men display is a good sign. So the question is, what signs will our responses to something similar show? When someone who has tormented us has something horrible happen to them, when we see a criminal being punished for their crimes, do we puff up or do we grieve at what they've been brought to? How much has the mercy of Christ gripped us and tenderized us? Maybe we need to grow more in the awareness of our own sinfulness and have a growing inclination to repentance. That is much better than fueling our own self-righteousness and a false view of our own goodness. We are not good in ourselves. We are only good and righteous and innocent in Christ alone. Well, finally, our text shows us a warning a warning of the fearlessness that brings judgment. David's immediate response was surprising to the Amalekite, and if so, the reward, quote-unquote, the Amalekite received was even more tragically unexpected, as we see in verses 13 through 16. We assume it's perhaps the next morning because David and his men mourned until evening, now that the immediate mourning is over, David wants some answers. He again questions the young man on his identity and his actions. Maybe asking again, where do you come from? Who are you? Is going to give him a chance to change his story and tell the truth. But the man again, we assume this is truth, identifies himself as an Amalekite. And now he adds, his family were sojourners. Meaning, although they were Amalekites, they lived among the people of Israel. And David asks him a pointed final question in verse 14. How is it you were not afraid to put out your hand and destroy the Lord's anointed? Now that probably needs an explanation. Before we discuss fear, what is so important about the Lord's anointed. Uh, scholar John Woodhouse explains it well. The Lord's anointed is Bible language for the one chosen and appointed by the Lord to represent the Lord as his king. There are two important ideas here, he says. The first is that only God himself may appoint and remove his king. Even when Saul had been rejected by God and David had been chosen and designated as his successor, no one but the Lord had the right to act against the one whom the Lord had anointed. 
Even David refused to do such a thing. By the way, we saw that twice in 1 Samuel. Woodhouse continues, the second idea is that to oppose the Lord's anointed is to oppose the Lord. See Psalm 2.2. Woodhouse concludes, all this David understood. Saul's armor bearer got it. The young Amalekite did not. Hopefully that helps us understand David's response. He tells the young man his own words condemn him, and he has the Amalekite executed. And David's question to this man gives us an important concept to remember. Fear is a good thing when it comes to sin. Fear of the Lord is a good thing. And it affects whether we sin freely or fight against sin. If you'll let me briefly quote Dale Ralph Davis again, David's question expresses a principle that should direct all kingdom ethics and behavior. There is in kingdom living such a thing as healthy, saving fear, a fear that preserves, a godly fear that should control us. End quote. See, brothers and sisters, the fear of God rightly understood, not slavish fear, but the fear of a son or daughter, the fear of awe, as when you stand between, in front of something that takes your breath away. The fear, this kind of fear of God is a mark of true piety and faith throughout the scriptures. For example, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Since we have these promises, beloved, those loved by God, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. These are those loved by God, and yet they're told to sanctify themselves in the fear of God. The Amalekite is an example of the opposite, of not fearing God, not knowing God, not caring about his laws, his honor, or what pleases him. We often think fearlessness is admirable, and it can be, but not when it comes to the Lord, not when it comes to sin. Psalm 36.1, transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart, there is no fear of God before his eyes. See, that kind of fear of God is really the difference between a genuine believer in Jesus Christ and a mere churchgoer or non-Christian or atheist. Fear will keep us from sin, or fearlessness of the wrong kind will keep us from God. David is suggesting that having lived in Israel, the Amalekite knew that to kill the Lord's king was against God's laws, was an offense to God. Now we know that the Amalekite didn't actually kill Saul, but lying is also against God's law. And as verse 16 emphasizes, your blood be on your own head. For your own mouth has testified against you. All of us can really echo that truth. We have no one to blame for our sin but ourselves. Our words testify against us. Our actions testify against us so that we are without excuse. The Amalekite is responsible for his own judgment and death, David is saying, because of his sin and guilt. It is the same with every human being. We cannot hide our sin. We cannot escape the guilt of our sin except through the means God has given, belief in his Son. But we need to know, Christian or non-Christian, we cannot hide it. As Moses wrote in Numbers 32, you have sinned against the Lord and be sure your sin will find you out. This is a good question for the churchgoer, or if you merely flip to this channel on YouTube, 
or for anyone who might not have a real faith in Jesus Christ, do you refrain from sin, from actions you know are wrong, only when you're around Christians, or only perhaps when you're around other people? Do you understand that as Jesus Christ himself taught, nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known? Luke 12, 2. Our view of sin and either its irrelevance or unimportance or its heinousness is ultimately connected to how we view the Lord God. Is he a permissive parent or grandparent who doesn't care about us and lets everything go with a wink and a nod? Or is he a truly loving father who we would hate to disappoint and who we know will not let us indulge in what will ultimately hurt us, hurt others, or eternally damage us. I want to tell you, the first option is not the God of the Bible. The second view is the picture of God that Scripture portrays. Is that how you see him? If you believe the first option, it is very likely that you do not know him. And you are in great danger of falling under his judgment. But unlike David, who was deceived, the Lord sees all. And he knows the truth about you. And he knows the truth about me and about all of us. But he offers his mercy to those who will turn to him. If you have never done so, I urge you to cry out to him. Admit your need and your sin and your offenses. And know that he offers his mercy to you. And there is nothing else like it. Christian, I pray that you too will grow in your fear of the Lord, rightly defined. When facing temptation, I pray that the fear of God will enable you to mirror the words of Joseph from Genesis 39.9. When faced with great temptation, he cried out, How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? As we grow in the right kind of godly fear, we will love the Lord more and also hate our sin more. And our minds will be more at peace as we will be freed from the guilt and burden of our sins. The Puritan John Flavel teaches our conscience's peace is directly proportionate to the degree to which the fear of God prevails in our hearts. Our story today has been a sad one. David's path to the throne is now clear, but it brings him no joy. Saul's judgment rightly came from the Lord, but David rightly grieves it and him. The Amalekite was judged by David for something he did not do. But God, through David, judged the Amalekite for everything he did do, particularly his lying, his opportunism, seeking wealth and favor. His sin found him out. Through Jesus Christ, our view of sin is different. Our hopes and priorities are different because like David and seemingly like his men, the Lord in Christ has given us new hearts that seek after him, that are enabled to seek his kingdom first and his righteousness. Brothers and sisters, let us continually seek to cultivate that kind of focus, that kind of priority in our lives. Let us remember that we live every single moment, coram Deo, before the face of God. And in Christ, that is not a fearful thing. 
in a slavish fear kind of way. That is a comfort. That is a motivation to continually turn from sin and turn to our Savior in daily repentance and faith. And in Him, the good news is we do not get our just deserts. We don't get what we deserve. We don't get judgment. But instead, we are pardoned and made righteous because Jesus Christ was judged in our place, because he obeyed in our place, and because he was sacrificed, punished, and bore our guilt in our place. Non-Christian, Will you look to him? Christian, will you continue to look to him and know his peace? Let's pray to him now. Lord Jesus, we thank you that though we rightly deserve the Amalekites' fate, you have spared us, saved us, and changed us. Father, we ask we would, that you would help us to daily to look to you in faith, continually turn from our sins in repentance, and as we behold you in your word, would you regularly help us to grow in fear of you each and every day. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his pardon. Thank you for his peace. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen.